Eric asked me to talk to you just to get some thoughts across about um, the stopping and starting, because it's often difficult to, to stop, and where do you start and what's holding back? So I'm going to share just a couple of pointers with you that come along that, and then you can give me some feedback and to each other, uh, kind of what resonates with you and what doesn't. So the first thing is to look at things in terms of business acumen. What is business acumen? Business acumen is really just understanding what a business does, but it needs to be able to do it in a way that makes money. So a lot of us are in busyness, not in business. A lot of us are so busy, we're not making money. So it's a way of really understanding, yes, let's be busy, but let's do something that is productive that makes money at the end of the day. Anyone recognize these people in this picture? You're on the left. Yeah. So you can still recognize me. That yeah. was a long time ago. <laughs> somebody once, I put this up once in a presentation, somebody said that's the young me and the old me. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyone knows the, the older guy? Anyone recognize him? It's a guy called Stephen Covey. Anyone heard the name Stephen Covey? He wrote that book called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, a very, very good book to read if you get the opportunity. Now, you mentioned my book. My book sold now close to 20,000 copies. It sounds good, but compared to him, it's nothing. Yeah. His is over 15 million copies. His book is sold worldwide. Why would I put that picture up? It's not to show off. It's to tell you that this is how Stephen Covey says is how we learn things. If you pick up a book and you read it, even if you understand everything that you've read, you've only got 10% of the knowledge. So I, I do a lot of lecturing at different business schools, and it's hard for me to say that because no matter how well I'm teaching, I'm only giving you this much. It's when you see other people do it. It's when you experience it. It's when you do it yourself. That's where you get most of the knowledge. And that's why people don't have to go to a university to be good at what they do. It's the experience that you have. What the university life gives you is maybe a slightly different way of thinking, but your true knowledge comes from really doing. That's what it does. And it's the experience. When I met with uh, Stephen Covey, I came home and I opened the book that he gave me and I gave him a copy of my book. And he wrote this in my book. He said, David, thanks for your book. And then I couldn't read what else he had written. <laughs> I don't know if you can read that. And I kind of looked at it and Stephen I thought, Kobe. Yeah, yeah, Stephen R. Covey. So, yeah, he signed it, but I don't know what this is. Give us something. Or, and I kind of looked at it and I thought, oh, well, don't understand it. And I left it for years. Uh, and then my mom-in-law came to visit. They live in Cape Town. And she happened to pick up the book and she opened it and she said, what is that? So I said, I don't know. She wrote to the officers in America. What does this mean? And we got this back. David, thanks for your book. You're a trim tab. So I had no idea what that meant as well. So she wrote back again and said, what the heck's a trim tab? We got this message. A trim tab is a small rudder that moves a big rudder that moves the whole ship. And I think they were trying to promote his next book. He wrote The Eighth Habit. They said this comes from page 32 of his next book. What he's saying is when a captain of a ship is trying to move the wheel, to move that whole ship, there's too much pressure. You can't do that. When he moves that, it moves the little rudder. That little rudder then moves the bigger rudder. The bigger rudder only then moves the whole ship. And I think that's an amazing little message. It's the little changes that make the big changes happen. So it's around what can we do? What is our little change that we can do that can have the big impact? It's important that we are all moving it in the same direction. If one person one day is moving the little tab this way and the next moment somebody is moving it that way, you're going to be all over the place. It's about knowing that the small things matter. They, that's what makes the big things happen. For me, this relates in two things. It relates in what you're doing. And when, when you feel like I'm a little cog in the wheel, I don't make a big difference, you are making a difference. Even if you're doing, even if you're the person sweeping in front of you, 
that is what's making an impact. And on all the sites that you have, it's those little things that have the big impact. I also like this saying, you don't drown by falling in the water. You drown by not swimming once you've fallen in the water. We all make mistakes. In fact, the only person who hasn't made a mistake is a person who hasn't achieved anything. We all make mistakes. It's what you do from then onwards. There's a concept that's going around now talking about failing fast, meaning if you don't know what to do, do something. And if it's wrong, then you'll find out that it's wrong and you can correct it. If you sit and you do nothing, you just get to what we call analysis paralysis, where you just think about it, then you never know which way would be the right way. So it's around, if things go wrong, correct it. And the only people who drown are the people who fall in the water, things go wrong, and they do nothing about it. Then you slowly, slowly drown, sometimes not slowly. So yeah, you've got an example of a businessman who would buy a watermelon for one euro and sell it for one euro fifty. So my question to you is, how can he sell that watermelon for more than he's buying it? Why would somebody pay him extra? Yes, he wants to make a profit, but the, why would the customer pay more for it? More convenient to buy from that guy who's offering the service as part of it. Okay, when you say more convenient, in what way would it be more convenient? More convenient might need to transport it from the market. Great. So or it might be the location zero. where yeah, it is. Yes. Yeah. The guy maybe delivers it to your house. You might deliver it, something like that. Anyone want to add on to what Franz said with well, how, how else could it be convenient? It's got. Yes, great. It's cut. You, you might not want to buy the whole thing. You might want to just buy a little bit. So people are willing to pay you for what we call the added value. And I'm sure you've heard the concept of added value, how you're adding value the whole time. So it's around that. And that's how a normal businessman would do it. Entrepreneurs are different. Entrepreneurs try to change things drastically. They take something, change it in a way that they're now selling something completely different. How could I change that? What do you think I could do with the watermelon? Make jam? Or my example's not jam, sorry. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, change the, the Into a product, correct. So instead of jam, maybe juice. So when you're taking a watermelon and not selling a watermelon, you're not selling the exact same thing that you're buying, you're selling something else, you're changing the form, you're now going from one euro to maybe five euros. You're selling it for a lot more. And if you sell the juice, you can see it looks beautiful in a nice glass with that little umbrella. Does that umbrella change the taste, do you think? No, it's just the appearance. But in fact, it does in a way change the taste. And I'll tell you why. If I gave you the same juice in a filthy cup that's broken and looks like someone else has had something to drink out of it, the way you feel about it when you're drinking it is different. If I give it to you in a glass with a little umbrella on top, wow, now you feel special. Part of your taste, part of your appearance of something is not just what you're getting. It's how you feel you're being treated. And, and I think your game specifically is around how you're treating. People are coming for an experience. This talks, I think, directly to what you do. And... The, that little umbrella, although it doesn't change the taste, it change, changes the taster, the person who's drinking it. And the question is, what is your umbrella? Everything that you drink, what is your little umbrella? How are you making it different? And you've got people working for you who will tell you, yeah, but I don't deal with the end customer. I don't have to worry about this. Everybody you deal with is your customer. When you're dealing with each other, you each other's customers, you're helping each other. You, that's what a team is around and about. Okay. There's a saying, there's a, Maya Angelo, I think, said, um, people might forget what you said, but they'll never forget how you made them feel. And, that, and that's crucial. Deline, do you agree with that? One of the most important things is using someone's name. Simple things. If somebody comes into one of the places and everyone knows their name, knows something about them, their name is important. I'm going to talk about that again just a little bit later. So it's important that you do the things, that you are working as a team. 
But some teams don't work efficiently together. Everyone will be exhausted at the end of the day, more exhausted than if they were working together. But they feel like they're doing something, but they're counteracting each other. Make sure that when you're working, each of you are focusing on your own little things, which we said with the trim tab, it's important to focus on the little things, but don't forget the big picture. At the end of the day, you, your, your eye has to be on that big thing at the end. But it's the little things that make it happen. So you, you've got to always have a dual focus. That's why we've got two eyes. One for the short term, one for the long term. <laughs> um, I heard recently, actually, they're doing an op like that when they do people's eyes, that they do the one to focus short term, and then you, the brain kind of compensates. Our contacts like that. One eye looks further, Okay. So is that why you look at <laughs> so why you look at some people? Okay. So you look at some people a bit skewed if it's not you. No, not really. Near and far. But that's that's exactly what we need to be doing here is is have both things visible at the same time. Look in the distance, know where you're going, but still concentrate what's right here. A lot of companies, I'm not saying it happens here, I don't I don't know enough about you. But a lot of companies operate where they look after themselves only. And they try and make themselves work and they think they've been successful. What you do if that's the case is you're doing this. You sit back. This whole boat is sinking. But you think that's not my problem. That's the other department. And you sit there and this guy says, I'm glad that's not at our end of the boat. It doesn't matter which end it is. You're either going to float together or sink together. So you need to work as a team, but know that it fits into what the whole company is doing. What we're looking at when we're looking at a team is, and this is Simon Sinek. I don't know if you've, uh, if any of you have heard of Simon Sinek. He's an American uh, guy who presents to companies, and he's, he talks about the why, finding your why, why you're doing stuff. But one of the quotes he said is, a team is not just a group of people who work together. A team is a group of people who trust and support each other. That's a team. When you're just going to work, you're working, you need to build the trust and support each other. And, and it's one of those things, it's like a spiral. It's either spiraling up or spiraling down. That's how things work, all, all relationships. And you are building relationships with each other. And if you help a person today, they'll help you tomorrow tomorrow. If you're working for the same goal, if you're working for opposite goals, it might not. This is an interesting story. I, what I used to do pre-COVID is I worked with some of the business schools and I'd take MBA students to different countries. We do it within South Africa, but also different countries. We meet different companies or different things. And we get talks from CEOs telling us about what they're doing in the business, et cetera. And it, it kind of, that whole thing of broadening the experience. This was in Seattle. Flying Fish, there's actually a book written called Fish where the guys took what they were doing and they, um, they kind of show, they throw fish at each other. So this is a guy that works there. He, his whole life is just serving people fish. He's not a CEO of a company and, and they throw the fish together. So I put this little thing together of what they do. You can see it. And then I asked him a few questions. And listen to what this guy has to say. How are you Guys, we back for airline travel and we ship anywhere in the U.S. Yeah, if you live in Ohio, you can eat fresh seafood too. Yeah. So Ryan, uh, what, what makes this, what business lesson can you tell us? What makes a good job or good uh, what makes it enjoyable? Why we are world famous is not because we throw fish, it's because we uh, hang out with people. Uh, we try to make people's days, in turn, we sell lots of fish. So it's really about like who we're being and like beat 
interested, not interesting. It's kind of like the idea. And then teamwork. There's a big amount of like respond and acknowledge. Everybody yells it out. Uh, it's how we flow. It's how we work. It's how, you know, like you have to know it's being thrown at you, right? You yeah. can't just randomly throw stuff yeah. at people without them like knowing what it is. Uh, so yeah, just our communication. And then just like we come in and we have a morning huddle at the beginning of every morning and at the end of every night just to kind of like get here in the morning maybe you got something on your chest you gotta get off so then you can be here you can be present right because otherwise people always have these conversations going in their head and uh if you can acknowledge that conversation and be like cool i'm not gonna let you run me today i'm not gonna be in a bad mood because that yes i'm never in a bad mood uh but uh yeah some people need that in the morning and i think it's good uh, and then at the end of the night we have a evening huddle and that is how we do do we make our goal today like we set a goal and an intention for the morning and then at the end of the day we check in and see All right. if we were full of it or if we were doing it or what we do so yeah excellent uh, Wait, would i've you been do here like three years and three some years. of these guys have been here 20 to 30 years wow, you know? wow. so it's like it's really like a lot of history in Seattle. Yeah. Like, these yeah. guys know everybody down here. It's like it's nuts. I'm like I know quite a few people who've worked here three years, but the whole market's like a small family in its own way, which is cool. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, have fun in Seattle. Eat lots, drink lots. There's uh there's a lot of fun to be having around. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Awesome, thank you. Amazing Zit. This is a guy who just sells fish. He hasn't even been there since the start. He's only been there three years, it's been going forever. He's not the only fish manga there. There are these little fish stalls. When I was there in this little marketplace, there must be five other fish stalls. They're all making money. They're all surviving. You don't have to throw fish to survive. But as you can see, there's a whole crowd around it. They wrote books about it. Uh, when I found out we were going to Seattle, I made sure I went there because I'd heard about it. Not everybody standing around looking becomes a customer. Some of them just there for the show. But overall, do you get the sense of everybody knows what they're doing and why, why they're doing it? So he said a lot. And I saw you weren't taking notes, eh? So I took notes for you. <laughs> the things he said, we try to make, make people's day. In turn, we sell a lot of fish. The aim, you don't go there trying to sell fish. You're trying to make someone's day, and in, in turn, they make your financial year. And I think that relates to what you're doing as well. Your whole product is about making people stay. If you do it correctly, they will make your financial year. Be interested, not interesting. Okay. Be interested, that means the focus is on them. Not you. It's not you. Don't walk around here saying, "Look what we can do. Look how we can build these things. Look how great we're building it." It's look how we can build this because of this need that you have or that need. It's about fulfilling those needs. It's the focus is on them, not you. Teamwork for them specifically. And he said, "If you don't respond and acknowledge, you're going to get hit by a flying fish." <laughs> In your case, it might be slightly different. But you need that communication. Everybody needs to know what the other one's doing, how they communicate. Group huddle. They get together in the morning and say, this is what we're going to do. They get together in the evening and saying, this is what we've done. Have we achieved it? You don't have to do that every day. The more, sometimes the better. Sometimes it's overkill. But as long as people understand what that underlying message, the same as when you're rowing, are you all rowing in the same direction? The same as when you're doing your little job, is your little job turning that trim tab in the same direction? And it's about each of you getting your team to do it, but then amongst yourselves also getting the bigger picture. And that's what's crucial. And be happy present. It's about when you hear you hear. When you're focusing, focus on this. They, they did a, a study on multitasking. You know, a lot of people say, I can multitask, I can do things. If you can, if you can do this, what I'm going to describe now, you can multitask. If you can write with both hands simultaneously, different things in different languages, 
then you multitask. Otherwise, you're not multitasking. And I think they, the only people who can do that is if you had some brain damage. Because you, you're operating with two different brains. A special person. A special person. When we think we're multitasking, what we're really doing is what computers do. We're switching from one task to another, and sometimes very quickly. Sometimes we can switch, 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 but you're switching, and in between, you're missing. They say the most effective and functional people who can concentrate 100% on something while they're doing that, and then eventually concentrate 100% on something else, not the other way. And, and they've done a study with the youngsters who are coming out of university now and going to work. They sit at their desks with their phones in front of them like this, and they're busy work, and then it beeps, and they look down. That moment you're losing, you're losing not just the moment, you're losing your thought process, et cetera. They're finding that they're 30 to 40% less productive. So where are we looking at? And can we look at things where we, are we really focusing on what we should be focused? Eric gave some input of what he's looking for. And he says, this is what we should be doing. You want to be a globally efficient player and you need, you need those partnership alliances. That's number one. So that would kind of be the direction that you're heading into. That has to be supported by efficient people, but not just efficient people, it's team orient orientated efficient people. I can be very efficient, but I'm efficient just doing my own thing. It's about being efficient, working for the team, not just for me. Okay. Working in a great self-improvement environment. Eric has a strong belief that it's about improving the company, but improving yourself. If you, if every one of us improves ourselves in some way, we, we're improving the company. So it's about what can you do to keep improving yourself? What are the things that you can learn? What are the things that you can bring into your life in general? If you've got a better home life, you've got a better work life. Uh, all contributing to the company and country's growth. He's not just looking at the company. It's for the case of the country. I saw today somebody sent a little clip to me about apparently, you know, in Dubai, they've got this the 20, the 2020 exhibition. This is only a couple of years late. But you got that and they got the South African stand. And the person sent me the picture of the South African stand with a very sad face saying, was embarrassed. Did you see that? Was embarrassed to see the South African stand. We as a country, we have so much to offer. This is the window to the world, and apparently it's offering nothing happened. Yeah. 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 yeah, fruit juices, sauces, uh, really? Yeah. So, I mean, that, that's a huge opportunity missed with, with, your, with the country. How can we help ourselves and the country grow? And, and so you've got a broad range of products, and you can have impact in so many different areas. Think a little bit broader. How can you do that? What can you do? So I want to share one more story with you. And this is from that same trip in Seattle. Starbucks started in Seattle. And I spoke to some of the people. That's in fact in, in front. That's in the first Starbucks store. In fact, it, when you go there, they've actually kept it like the original one. What business is Starbucks in? Coffee. Where did it start? In Seattle. Seattle. Yes. Where, is that where Seattle? Yeah, yeah. We did Seattle. From the same, no, no. So there is a story around that. Yeah. So the people, in, the, the people who started Seattle, it was a couple who actually left Starbucks and started their own. Yeah. And they, yeah. and so they, they used the name yeah. Seattle. <laughs> and they don't accept it. So you say Starbucks is in coffee. That's a stupid question, isn't it? The CEO of Starbucks says something else. He says, we are not in the coffee business serving people. We are in the people business. We just happen to be serving coffee. The focus is not on the coffee. The focus is on the people. It, from the outside, it looks like it's the same. It's not. And, and I think that's the message that Eric wants to get across, is working 
to get the bigger picture right. In order to get the bigger picture right, you've got to focus on those little things. But the focus part of that needs to be people. And it's not just people out there. It's people in here. It's working together as a team. They told me the story. I was going to say a lovely story. I don't know if it's such a lovely story about this. You know, as you wrote your names and I said, then I called out your name earlier and I said, I'm going to come back to the names. When you go into Starbucks and you order coffee, they write your name on the cup. And most people think they're just doing that so that they know whose coffee it is. They could use numbers if they wanted to. It's personalized. You go to Starbucks, I order a coffee. In like a minute, I hear, David, your coffee is ready. At home, I get, David, go get your own coffee. <laughs> So they tell a story that in one of their stores in Seattle, a guy came to order some coffee. I don't know what his name was. I'm going to call it Chum for the purpose of the story. And the woman serving him saw that he was very sad. He like, you know how some people, there's, some people are sad, but this guy looked like he had the world on his shoulders. He looked really sad. And it's not the procedure. It's not what they normally do. But beside his name, she just put a little quote. Look up the sun is shining or something like that. And she wrote a little quote and he got his coffee and away he went. The next day, Jim came back. Happened to get the same lady serving. Him. Still looked sad. She wrote another quote. And this continued. The guy came in four, sometimes five times a week and ordered coffee, and before long, you know, they spoke to each other, and they went and Googled sayings, and they waited for Jim to come in so they could put the saying on his cup. <laughs> and, and this continued for about three months. And then after three months, Jim never came back. And a few weeks went past, and Jim never came back. And they wondered what had happened. And somebody said they saw him go into this building and they kind of tracked down and they came and on the door was the name Jim and they knocked on the door. And a young girl opened the door and they explained who they are and why they're there. And they said, listen, we used to write these sayings for Jim and he hasn't been back. What happened? And she said, oh, you guys are from Starbucks. Please come in. And she said, Jim was my father. He was sad because he was dying from cancer. And that's why like he came with, and that's why he felt like you, you could actually tell he was dying of cancer and he's passed away. She said, but please come into the lounge. And she took them into the lounge. And in the lounge was a big bookcase. There were no books on that bookcase. There were empty cups of coffee. He had kept every single cup with the same. The whole bookcase was full of those sayings. I'm, I'm getting emotional. I don't even know them, but this is the story. What impact are you having on your customer if he's keeping not your product? Their product is not cups. Their product is coffee. What impact are you having on your customer if in their dying days, they're keeping the container of your product. That's all the cups are, the container. And it had an impact on him that he kept that. And it obviously had an impact on his daughter that she still had it. So what can you do that can make people feel like that? That in their dying days, they're collecting what you're giving just a final question to you, and, and we don't need answers now. I just want you to think around these things. Is the only reason we don't change is that something's holding us back? And is it what can be done to make this easier for you? What can, what can be done to make the change easier? What is preventing you from doing it? Do you not have the... The actual skills for finances, maybe. maybe you can go and do a course on finances. Is there a blockage between communications between you? Can we unblock that in some way? 
what is it that is one holding you back in terms of out there, external, or holding you back internal? Once you know what that is, you can start working, and it's, an, it's incredible how you can change over time. Humans live in default. Whatever the default is, we love sticking to that because we don't have to think. It's hard to change. They say that the only person who likes change is a baby with a wet nappy. Okay? Then there's an impetus to change. But often, and I'm sure if you think back to your own lives, if you look back, there were things that you didn't want to change. And when you change, you think, wow, that made a difference. Why didn't I do it earlier? Look at work the same way. What can you do in your teams? What can you do into teams that can make this company greater for yourselves and for the whole country? And how did that go? Flake, flake, my story is eight. Is that? <laughs> so it's time to rise and shine. Or is it time to sink or swim? So I've shared a lot of things with you. I hope some of them will have an impact. I'm David Zidel, and thank you for listening.